Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for another candid conversation. We're going to slowly let the line populate with participants. My name is Lisa Johnson. I'm the founder of Private School Village. I'm a mom of two and I have the pleasure tonight of moderating this discussion on affinity groups. We have two powerhouses with us. Rosetta Lee, who is faculty and outreach specialist with Seattle Girls School, and Gina Parker Collins, who's founder, advisor, and parent leader of Resources in, in, in Independent School Education, also known as RISE Organization. Welcome, ladies. Mm -hmm. um, Thank just, you. So everyone knows a bit of housekeeping. This conversation, as with all of our webinars, is being recorded. It will be posted on the Private School Village YouTube channel no later than tomorrow. Um, and we're gonna do our best to get to as many questions that were submitted as possible. This was a very popular webinar. Um, so if we're not able to, I would just encourage you to tap into the resources that we will share with you tonight and after to continue the conversation and, and get those answers to your questions. So without further ado, let's dive on in. Mm -hmm. Ladies, I'd like you each to take an opportunity to answer this first question. What are the three most important things to keep in mind when considering creating an affinity group? What makes them most successful in the long term? Rosetta, would you get us started? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think one of the uh, most important things uh, we can do is to define clearly what we are talking about. And so for my school, for example, we define what an affinity group, which is people who identify that way coming together, an alliance group, which is really people who identify a certain way and their allies coming together, and then interest groups, which are like shared interests. So for me, that makes it really clear whether the Asian affinity group or the Asian interest group and who's coming to that table. And, and for me, without that clear definition, oftentimes folks are like, can I, can I join? When really it's not a conversation for them. The second piece is this, define what the group's goals are about. Because as soon as you start them, you're gonna get questions about, this is like segregating. I'm like, well, here's the thing. Sometimes I need to have conversations with um, Asian students about colorism in the Asian community. That's actually not a conversation for everybody. And so if our mission says we are going to talk about intra-group dynamics as well as, as well as our positionality in society, then it, again, affinity groups really do make sense. And the third piece is this, leadership has to back it up. Oftentimes, uh, teachers or diversity directors or caring parents will start them up. And inevitably, people who understand the value of affinity groups will challenge it. And at the end of the day, is the person backing up uh, the structure, the head of school, or somebody who is often easily challenged or um, feel like their positionality in the school can be threatened. So for me, those three things are pretty critical. As for sustaining, I think well-run affinity groups increase that sense of student belonging, family engagement, connectivity, and so it becomes a self-perpetuating process if it's running well. If it's not, and it sort of fizzes out, uh, then that kind of tells you what needs to change, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I would add to that, um, Rosetta. Um, I, I feel the same way that you do. Um, my top three things, though, in addition to what you said, would be to you know to build it, to create it, right? Mm -hmm. Don't wait for the green light, right? Mm -hmm. um, build it; they will come. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, we wonder, you know, well, do we have enough people to have an affinity group? Um, but again, it's about building it. And in time, people will, you know, buy into the opportunity. Um, it's a non-negotiable as far as I'm concerned. I think that's another big thing. Uh, we cannot afford to not have affinity spaces. They are safe spaces. They are spaces to network. They are spaces of power. Um, they are spaces to have influence and um, to have impact. So I consider them a non-negotiable. And I think we'll get into some of those questions later about resistance. Um, I think... Um, the third thing is to design it very much to what you were saying, Rosetta. You have to be very clear with a mission and a vision. Um, and so, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna plan, you're gonna plot, everything Killer Mike said, those are the things that you need for an affinity space. And I think, uh, you know, as far as sustaining is, is concerned, um, in addition to having the buy-in from the top, you have to have a budget. You need to be part of somebody's line item, mm -hmm. right? To be able to sustain it and have it grow. Um, you need to be in partnership with your other stakeholders in the community, not for oversight, 
okay? Um, but for partnership. And, and those are the things I would say are helpful and sustaining. Mm -hmm. Okay, you guys just mentioned so much. And yes, we're gonna, talk, we're gonna get into it. And my mind is like, okay, first, here's the, I wanna get into this. What should school administrators do if they get negative feedback, like you mentioned, from other community members related to mm -hmm. feeling left out or excluded mm -hmm. or the notion that these types of groups divide and segregate? Mm -hmm. How can schools best build parent and community buy-in? Mm -hmm. Um, is there a particular question you'd like to answer? Wrote that, I'm sorry, yes, you first okay. mentioned, yeah. Yes, um, so for me, I think one of the things that we can do is uh, the beauty of the private school village is that we are talking about private schools, which are giant affinity spaces, mm -hmm. okay? So basically, it's people who say, hey, the school's mission, vision, uh, environment, a community really speaks to me, so I am going to ask to get in. There's an application process and you get in, and it is not a free for all where anybody can en enter. Now, are they, um, like, you can argue that they are exclusive spaces, but I don't see private schools opening up their doors to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's that idea of why do we have this um, private space? It's ultimately about getting the needs met and supporting and in having alignment around things like core values. For me, affinity spaces do the same. And in fact, schools are full of affinity spaces. We have teams, we have clubs, we had grade level, grade levels, we have honors classes, um, we have faculty rooms. All of those spaces are spaces where some people can go and others actually are invited not to attend because they have specific purposes. To me, affinity groups are just another space, right? Um, and when I think about like the idea of feeling left out, um, oftentimes I think about, uh, you know, the resistance, I'll be honest with you, race-based affinity groups, a lot of the resistance come from white folks. Um, and the reality is they don't always have too many spaces where they are not allowed in. So it just feels a way, right? So sometimes I like to create parallels, like when you travel abroad, okay, and you are surrounded by people whose, whose cultures, looks, identity, et cetera, et cetera, are not like yours. Um, do you do things like go to uh, resort spots or do you go to things like the embassy, right? Those are all actually kind of affinity spaces where you know you belong and you can show up and you feel safe and comfortable and um, like you can be there and you're going to run into people who speak your language. To me, um, in a predominantly white institution, which many private schools are, in a culturally US mainstream space, which most independent schools are, um, this becomes sort of like the embassy space where kids, kids and families can come to be real about their experience and use that as a platform to advocate to the larger community. Excellent. I, I, I just add one thing. I think it's a, an affinity space when it's race based is a real opportunity, one of the first opportunities to dismantle white supremacy, mm -hmm. really, you know, it's, it's, it is, um, you know, the, the, the school in and of itself is an affinity space, right, that is predominantly white. So the idea that you now need my space too, is a little, you know, mm -hmm. troublesome to me. Yes. Um, but I think, you know, schools really just top leadership needs to be um, um, flexible, resilient, have some grit, and just say, you know, we, we want to make sure that everybody feels like they belong. And, and for me, I know a, a, an affinity space was the first space that welcomed me into my independent school. And I was so happy it was there, you know, and it allowed me to, you know, build community within community and then fan out, mm -hmm. you know, go to the PA from there or, you know, work in some other areas where I can have some impact. So Gina, you, I, I want to ask you, what do you recommend? Let's back it up what do you recommend schools start with first? You know, do they start with student, student affinity groups, faculty or staff, families, combination? How do schools determine that greatest need? You, you mentioned just getting started, but that can be daunting in and of itself when you have a lot of different groups you're trying to serve. How do you, how do you pick and choose where to start? You know, so listen, you can do them all at the same time. You know, it's like they're different stakeholders. You have parents, you have faculty members, and you have students. And when you're talking about race-based affinity groups, the need is immediate. The need is immediate. So, um, you know, this COVID experience has taught all of us um, 
that we can really trust in the capacity of our schools to do a lot of things at one time. Mm -hmm. And generally, there are certain leaders that are leading any particular effort, right? So there's going to be a parent leader, there's going to be a faculty leader, there's going to be a student leader who says, hey, you know, I want in um, and let's get this done. So you can, you can do them all at the same time. You don't need to wait mm -hmm. at all. Excellent. Yeah. So Rosetta, what are your thoughts and suggestions for implementing affinity groups for the first time during hybrid or virtual learning? Mm -hmm. Are they more important than ever now? And how do we do it now, given the new normal? Yeah. Uh, and so one of the things that I think about is the virtual environment does allow us to do some unique things. So instead of trying to sandwich a time when the kids are available um, in between classes or who's got a free period or what's lunchtime and things like that, I think many of our hybrid schedules uh, or virtual schedules have um, bigger chunks of time in between classes. And so to me, I think uh, there's actually additional opportunities. Um, and again, you know, Gina, I love this idea of like, sometimes initially you might not get a big attendance, but it grows um, mm -hmm. as people feel safe. And so I think about some of the students who are already in the school or some of the families who are already in the school who have been craving for a space like this, you mm -hmm. start it up and they will come, right? And um, hopefully some folks will just come to check it out and realize the nature and feel and the um, heart of the place and will come back and others will hear through the grapevine what kind of space we're talking about and they will show up, right? And so for me, I think uh, oftentimes success is measured in how many people attend the first session. And I would really push us in our thinking about that because sometimes the choir will show up first and they will practice and then they will sing to the crowd and then the crowd will join. Mm -hmm. um, so please do start. Uh, and not wait for the in-person because to a certain degree, it's a lot easier for me when I don't know what a space is about to log in and sort of passively sort of check it out and then come back when I want to. Whereas if you say it's an in-person time and I got to walk through the door and decide whether I want to sit down or leave, um, that's actually a bigger sort of um, risk for me in terms of uh, what, whether I might like try it out or not. So I think we should start virtual uh, in this time not just because of necessity, but because I think there might be actually additional benefits that come from it. We actually, we have the additional question of what are the, what are the guidelines or the thoughts around there being increased maybe safety concerns about having sensitive conversations in a, you know, environment where maybe you're not alone, you're sharing screens, you know, what kind of guidance would you offer schools in terms of guiding their families who might be trying to participate in these spaces? Mm -hmm. I'd say do webinar, <laughs> I think is a more controlled environment, right? So choosing the right platform, um, creating community norms, you know, establishing from the beginning, you know, how we are going, what's the decorum gonna be? How are we gonna handle this? To make sure that it is a safe space, but also a space that allows for um, systems to be challenged, you know? Uh, so I think really being clear about um, your mission and your vision, and I think once you get to that space um that should have already been established you know what your mission and vision is you know how are you going to handle meetings and we also have to lean into fear right we have to lean into discomfort uh we do it every day anyway when we walk into the building when it was you know a, a physical um a space that we would walk into every day um it is what it is i mean there's there's you know we're, we're really talking facts mm -hmm. right so if we stick to the facts, talk from the eye perspective, I mean, you know, there's all sorts of different community yeah. norms, yeah. but um, we can't kind of police yeah. people's experiences and yeah. feelings, you know, as mm -hmm. uncomfortable as it may be, but um, we, we should definitely be coming from a strength-based approach. Mm -hmm. You know, affinity groups are not um, pity parties, mm -mm. right? Nor are they, you know, continuous celebratory experiences. I mean, that's good. We need to uplift ourselves in cultural ways um, and acknowledge that and, and, all, and all of our cultural capital, but we also need to talk about some serious business, which is making sure that our spaces yeah. are safe for our children, yeah. right? our yeah. places where we can network, our places where we can have impact mm -hmm. for our schools. Yeah. And logistically speaking, I would say it should have password protection, right? Yep. 
It should have a waiting room so that um, folks who are getting the link and the password are people who have at, like signed up with their identity and said, I wanna participate. And if folks who are not part of that community or have gotten access to that space somehow, like, you know, um, there, the waiting room allows you to like quietly exit folks who are showing up away who either um, shouldn't have been there in the first place or are interested in creating toxicity in the space. And so if you have norms and somebody shows up in a way that is not making it safe, then you just put them into the waiting room and have an offline conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, and folks are like, you know, it seems really secretive. Honestly, I, we teach classes that way. My students need a classroom link and a password and I use waiting rooms because there is such a thing as Zoom bombing, right? And I would say it is a, um, a space where people, it should be a challenge by choice. When people want to share, they should be able to share. And if people are not feeling comfortable yet, and that's okay too, right? And so I, I feel the idea of security, but honestly, um, I think we've known how to create security in uh, web spaces for a long time. So let's not have that be the, the hurdle excuse. that stops us. Excellent, yeah. excellent. And technology certainly does empower us in a different way. Rosetta, when there are only a handful of black students mm -hmm. in elementary school, mm -hmm. is it more important to have a race-based affinity space for them or will it further alienate our children from their non-black peers? Is a multicultural club of sorts better when representation is low and developmentally the black students seem resistant to being separated out? That's, That's a good question, Rosetta. That's a good question. Yeah. And it is so multifaceted, right? Yeah. And so I think about, for example, the fact that we're talking about elementary school, I think about what does it mean to actually have a um, like a family gathering so that they can actually come to the space with their family, and it feels like a larger group, a community, et cetera, before we ask them to show up to a student-only affinity space where I'm like, I don't know who these people are, and they're not in my class or in my grade, and uh, asking an elementary school age child to show up to an affinity space is really challenging. Um, I often also think about the fact that the girls, uh, or the, so the black kids, I promise you, are already um, creating affinity with trusted adults, right? And so for me, it's uh, leverage that space. It's actually about, I'm thinking about a, um, a black teacher who always talks about the black girls wanting to come and have lunch with her, right? So she started a black girl magic lunch group. That is an affinity space, but it was already in existence. What she did was made it official, gave them validation for the fact that they're seeking out the space for a reason and it's serving a purpose, right? Um, sometimes when we have like students of color affinity group, um, I often think about the fact that yes, it, it increases the numbers and yes, you, it, it does feel like a larger community. And I think it does a couple of things. It positions white and non-white, right? And it also does things like you need to dilute the curriculum or the programming enough so that everybody feels like they have skin in the game. And that is pretty challenging, especially for elementary school. Like I think about this, my, I claim to be a person of color, not because it's a demographic check mark, but because I stand in solidarity with other people who are not classified as white. We can actually come together in solidarity and coalition to create change and challenge white supremacy. That is not a place where elementary school kids are gonna be, <laughs> right? Um, and then so, uh, you know, I, I think about like all those like sort of multiple pieces. As for kids not wanting to join, I would invite you to think about actually um, this idea of what are we doing to help them feel that sense of connection all, like in, in building community that we do for all children, but especially for black children, right? Um, because ultimately I think about the fact that if they're not showing up to a space or don't wanna to come to an affinity space, it's often a, I get some sort of negative or um, vibe or whatever that says, uh, you know, black people congregating is somehow bad or dangerous or wrong, right? Or every single time I highlight my blackness, something bad happens to me. So why would I show up to a space where you say this is a space for black people? So I'm gonna like really extra highlight that. So for me, kids not wanting to join is actually an indication that right now when they're self-identifying or showing up, um, as who they are, they are getting some messages. So for me, we got to undo those messages and not blame the kids for not wanting to show up. 
I want to add to that really quickly, and I know we want to get on to the next question. I do have a model for a lower school affinity spaces mm -hmm. where kids actually want to show up. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, Riverdale Country School actually has it. Uh, it's been it's over ten years old now. It's called SOC Students of Color Society. They meet after school. It's well curated with mm -hmm. affirmations, with you know just letting kids be. It's multiracial. It's black. It's is. Latinx is, is Asian, is biracial. Um, I will say when it first started, it was just black students. Then the Latinx students started coming in, then biracial students started coming in, and Asian students. I mean, it's, it's a really beautiful space mm -hmm. that culminates at the end of the year with the, uh, the last grade of the lower school, the fifth grade, having a graduation ceremony, which this year they did virtually. And it just highlighted the talent of our children. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, so it, it can be done mm -hmm. on a lower school level with, with really great intention mm -hmm. um, yes. and ways that really support our kids. And, uh, so it can, it can happen. Yeah. Do you see, Gina, do you see a need to have uh, it delineate, delineated by grade level? So a lower elementary and an upper yes. elementary? Yes, yes. So yes, yeah, SOX is, has lower SOX and upper SOX and they <laughs> come together at times. Yeah. Um, alum, SOX alum will come back to the lower campus to engage with the students. It's led by um, some really, it was started by uh, an admissions in slash enrollment. Mm -hmm. Um, administrator, a, a couple of faculty members, all black, one white. Um, and, you know, it's just flourished over time. And it prepares them as they move to the next level to then maybe break out into race-based mm -hmm. affinity groups as they get older. Mm -hmm. And part of it is like paying attention to the developmental needs, right? Yeah. Because honestly, kids notice difference and they're starting to pick up on the fact that, uh, you know, the world is painting a picture about who they are and they want to process that but honestly like developmentally speaking it's starting starting third grade that kids are starting to become aware of major societal stereotypes and by fifth grade they're starting to internalize them right so the conversations that you have with fourth and fifth graders they're like grappling with like is this true about me or you know i'm starting to feel away i'm you know and so there are like serious issues that are real for them lower elementary school kids really when they show up they're like oh, other people in the room look like me and usually i'm the only one in my class and we're like yay <laughs> right and so to me the lower school space just feels it's, it's really about giving them that sense of affirmation, being able to do things like highlight stories and activities where they go, that reminds me of my home or culture or that character looks like me. Whereas for the older elementary, it's starting to really get them at the time when they're becoming aware of some systems things and starting to internalize. How can we like hijack that process and make sure that their sense of self and confidence is maintained? Right. That's when the friendships start to shift between mm -hmm. third and fifth grades. That's right. so, uh, you know, a, an affinity space becomes even more important, mm -hmm. a, a place of refuge and mm -hmm. empowerment. Yeah. So Gina, can you speak to a little bit more about who should own an affinity group? Parent volunteers, students, or the school? The, the, the person says, I asked because participation in our affinity group seems dependent on student or parent engagement which depending on the year can mean very little activity, continuity or growth, or we become responsible for assemblies or Black History Month programs. Uh, who should own these affinity groups? Mm. Uh, I think it's co-ownership. I don't think, I know it's co-ownership, but everybody has a role. So the school um, certainly adds, gives its buy-in, but parents are not waiting for that buy-in. Um, if that means that you do have to meet on the outside or, you know, right now we have these virtual spaces to meet, right? Mm -hmm. You do that. Um, the school should fund it, right? So again, there should be some line item there, um, whether that's coming through the parent association, head of school, I don't know, where, wherever it's coming from, it, it, it needs to be funded by the school. Um, the parents the students and the faculty need to manage it themselves, right? They need to manage it. They need to um, come up with opportunities for engagement and development and celebration. Um, schools can partner with each of those stakeholders. What is it that you need? How can I help, right? 
do you want me in this space? Do you not want me in this space? Um, they need to um, also have ownership of backing up these affinity spaces that are so valuable to our schools mm -hmm. by way of marketing, development, you know, um, just really, you know, putting them mm, in community, you know, that's, that's what we do. So I think it's a co-ownership um, and everybody p plays a role. Mm. Does that answer? No, that's excellent. Rosetta, do you have anything you want to add? Um, I would just, um, the only thing I would add is the um, empowerment is great, um, but passing the buck is not okay. Um, because for a school to say, well, we don't have any parents who are leading the group this year, so we're not going to run it. I think that is a real shame. Yeah. Uh, and so parents are busy. They've got a lot of bandwidth. They're trying to juggle a lot. So if there is no parent leadership that steps up, then I think the school provides a facilitator. I also think about making sure that the school is um, partnering with the group so that if they are discussing things where the school can learn something and maybe improve something, mm -hmm. that there is a point person who is responsible for connecting with the groups to hear the concerns or requests or suggestions or whatever and amplifying it up. Because for me, there's nothing sadder than an affinity group that comes together and they identify all of these like proactive improvement um, ideas, but there's no place to take it or nobody's listening. Yeah, that's a good point. And I would also add succession planning is very important. Yes. As parents, we are responsible for identifying, you know, as soon as we're in that chair role, that, that mm -hmm. co-chair role, who the next person in line is, you can see it. You can see how they walk into a room, how, they, how often they raise their hands, what, how they're contributing to the communication. So uh, definitely succession planning is important. And I totally agree with you with a point person, you know, and that point person very well could be your head of school. Right. Rosetta, does that point person who's the representative from the school need to be belong to that affinity group? Does it need to be, can, it, can a gay faculty member um, or I'm sorry, can a straight faculty member run a gay affinity space or can a white person run an affinity space for people of color? Yeah, and I think about the idea of ideally it's somebody who identifies that way because I think there is a level of understanding, trust and shared experience that you bring, bring into the space, which is really um, part of creating that safe space. Now, sometimes as a realistic and lo lo logistical reality, there is nobody who identifies that way. And I'm also not a fan of uh, volunteering people to run an affinity group because they identify a certain way, right? So we have this black affinity space and you're the only black teacher, so you're it. Like, I, I, I don't actually believe in that model. Um, but I think it should be really clear. Like when I was asked to facilitate a Latinx affinity group, one of the things that I showed up and said was, my job is to make sure that there is a space for us and that I make announcements during community meeting to remind you about when the meeting is and that I bring some snacks, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm there to make sure that people are being kind and respectful to one another and take turns. And I'm there to, if there are concerns or needs that you need the school to know that I am receiving that and passing that on. I am not here to tell you what your experience is or what you should think or do or believe. Um, and if you are looking for resources, I will go seek them out. I will be trying to pull in people, maybe not uh, part of the faculty and staff, but maybe folks from the community who look like you and share your experience so that they can come in and be that adult role model. So that's my role. Like I'm very clear about this is my dance space, but this is like, you know, for me, like being an Asian affinity leader, there's a lot more uh, like participation that I do from the eye perspective, a lot more sort of mentoring that I do for young Asian people who are trying to figure out this thing, right? Um, but for me, um, I'm very clear if I don't identify that way, um, what, what the boundaries of my support are. And I think folks appreciate that because I'm not there to like pretend I'm one of the gang because I've read so many books. I think that's really artificial. Excellent. Gina, do you have anything you want to add? I uh, know. Um, Excellent. I'm well, I do have a question for you, though. <laughs> I'm a parent and I want our school to start a race based affinity group for students, but the school is resistant. What's your advice if the school just won't do this? Should parents informally create some sort of support group outside of school? 
I, listen, I think it's very important to identify who the decision maker really is, right? Who's telling you no? Who's resistant to it? And I'm curious as to why, right? Like, that's a really good question. Why is it that um, you don't think my, my, that I need a safe space here as a, as a marginalized, underrepresented family or faculty member or student? I mean, I, I, I don't understand that. You, you, you chose me to be part of community. You know, you bought into me, I bought into you. I'm telling you what I need. So I, I don't, I don't know. I, that's a resistant part. Mm -hmm. I think it's, 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 there needs to be more conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think the higher up you go in having this conversation, mm -hmm. the better the outcome will be. But again, as Rosetta and I said, you really don't need to wait for the green light, mm -hmm. especially now. I mean, we need affinity spaces now more than ever with the testimony of our children, you know, the racial moments, the racial trauma that, you know, they've led the way, mm -hmm. you know? So I really would be surprised right about now. Some yeah. schools said, yeah. you know, we're not doing it. Yeah. Maybe, and one of the things that I've- right for you, Right? Yeah. And Gina, I, I so appreciate you naming the current context because honestly, there is a practical movement that is happening with Black At right? The Instagram mm -hmm. posts of alums and current students talking about experiences of being Black in independent schools, okay? And I think about where was the space, the safe space for them to talk about what happened? Where was the facilitator to help them process those strategy, uh, those stories, build resilience, equip them to go back and bring it up to the school to say, what are we going to do about this, right? So for me, in the absence of spaces like that, what you end up with is these uh, testimonies and accounts of real harm that was done. And so for me, if, if school leaders are often like, how do we avoid the next black ad? I'm like, affinity groups, curriculum change. more. You know, I, 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 I'm so, I have to add to yeah. that. Yeah. I would say that um, there are many schools that have affinity spaces mm -hmm for Black and Latinx students, mm -hmm. marginalized, underrepresented students, who have been the, the, um, the space to, to share and give testimony and stuff still did not happen. Mm -hmm. Things still did yes. not happen. Mm -hmm. Just because we have an affinity space does oh, not yeah. mean we will have solved the problem. I mean, as long as we are in private independent schools, mm -hmm we are going to run into what we just ran into. These stories are not going away. Mm -hmm. It's not what happens, it's how it's handled. Yes. And very often it's not handled the right way. So see, our students had to then put our love, the schools that we love on blast. Mm -hmm. Really, it was just a matter of, okay, I have to take it to, <laughs> where else am I gonna take it, right? Mm -hmm. So it was that perfect storm of two pandemics, mm -hmm. COVID and racism. Yeah. It allowed for this to, to bubble up. So, you know, affinity spaces are necessary and good and can have impact, but it doesn't necessarily mean things are going to happen. Overnight. Oh, absolutely. This is why that solid partnership and backup is so necessary, right? Because if that's not there and it's like tolerated, affinity spaces are tolerated, mm -hmm. then nothing really changes, right? It's celebrated. Yeah. Not tolerated. I also wonder too, though, at what point, how developed does an affinity space have to be in order to get to the place where kids actually feel safe in confiding in that way? Mm -hmm. um, and, and we do actually have a question. It says, as someone who is new to affinity spaces, what would you recommend as the first topics of discussion? Is it as broad as what has been experienced, they've been experiencing at school? And or when do you start to delve into the nitty gritty of some of this tough stuff? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you're just starting an affinity space or you're new to a school, I, I think building trust is extremely important, right? You know, um, what is that? You know, not all skin folk or kin folk, you know, like <laughs> yes. you, you have to build trust, <laughs> yes. right? In your community enough to be able to share the things that we harbor on the inside. I mean, as a parent and as a parent leader, I am proud to say that my children go to their school. But I also have a tremendous amount of guilt because I knew exactly what, what spaces I was putting them into to have mm -hmm. this academic excellence. So um, I think once you build some trust, then, you know, things will, you will start to feel as if you can confide. But it is important for the structure of the affinity space to kind of lay out different topics. Because mm -hmm. let me tell you something, we're not reinventing the wheel here. It's the same conversations. 
right? Mm -hmm. People will have left an independent school 20 years later, they come back and they're like, we're still talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's really, there, there are plenty of topics to talk about. You can be broad. I think there should be time where we just have the opportunity to resist through just having fun and mm -hmm. being joyful, right? So some of our affinity spaces are, you know, again, I don't know what it's gonna be like now that we're like still socially distancing. But whether you're having that time out outside of the school setting, right? Um, to just have fun as parents, to network as parents. I think we overlook that opportunity of networking, whereas our peers are constantly networking at our schools. So um, there is no right or wrong with, with what's the first discussion. It's really whatever is on your heart and whatever is in the game plan. Mm -hmm. right? We need yeah. to be flexible yeah. with that because um, sometimes our best laid plans can just go awry. I thought we were talking about this tonight, yeah. and, but this came into our space and we have to honor that. Yeah. And then if you want um, some sort of skeleton to spring off of, uh, there's a, another consultant, um, uh, Liza Talazan, who actually developed a uh, six session and 12 session affinity group curriculum. And I, you know, it's, it's not a shake and break, bake, but it certainly does give you some starting ideas around what might a flow look like, right? Um, and so, you know, again, we're not reinventing the wheel. You don't have to take the wheel as is, but there are wheels out there and you can take a look and go, that works for our community and that does not. Like, you don't have to start from scratch. And when we, when we finish, I will make sure to also send a link to some opportunities um, with the schools that we've worked with and the different platforms that we've put out there and you know, we'll make it available to private Excellent. schools. Excellent, and we'll take them. <laughs> um, man, that whole conversation right there just, if anyone knows me and you hear Gina speaking, <laughs> they understand why we, <laughs> why we relate so well, Gina. Um, Rosetta, what are best practices for white affinity groups? You have a lot of schools now toying with the idea and or launching mm -hmm. white affinity groups. Mm -hmm. How do you get white students to join white affinity groups so that they can learn about white privilege and develop empathy? Many white parents are dealing with guilt and or just don't want to get involved in this discussion and it trickles over to their children. How do we help compel them to dive in? Yeah, and so white affinity spaces, um, Basically, it's one of those like catch 22 situations because how do you get people with privilege to come to a space and learn about privilege that may bring, bring up discomfort and or guilt or shame. Ha ha ha. Welcome. Right. Um, so what of, and the other thing that I think about is sometimes schools uh, like want to create a white ally space and I'm like white allyship is actually a pretty sophisticated place of identity. Um, it's actually one of the later stages of white identity development. And so to ask people who identify that way to show up, um, oftentimes uh, it actually means that people who sort of like the title but not necessarily have done the work show up, right? Um, at the same time, I think there are lots of white uh, children and families who are trying to practice anti-racism, learn and grow, and they do need a space where they can do that at not at the burden or expense of people of color, right? And so again, be clear on your mission, right? Um, be clear on the mission of who is the space for, what is the work that will be done, right? I often think about like when I, um, when I supported uh, my school, like uh, toying around with white spaces, like for the fifth and sixth graders, we actually had them discuss like, when did this idea of white come up, right? And one of the questions we asked was, when did your family become white? Because honestly, there's usually a story, some sort of immigration story where it's like my Polish great grandmother came to the United States and then she anglicized her name and she stopped speaking Polish and eating Polish foods and practicing Polish culture. And then she became American and therefore white, right? And I think about like, what's that like? Do you, did you ever learn anything about like Poland or Polish cultures or foods or anything like that? And they're like, no. So how do I like, how do we recognize that white people lost something in the creation of race as well? How do we connect them um, back to their sense of ethnic heritage and identity? And then we can talk about that system that was created that harmed you and harmed me. Um, what are the ways that we can take action, positive action? How do we interrupt things like harmful actions and bias along the way? How do we add our voice with as people who won't be dismissed? Um, like, uh, you know, take, take positive action. So I think about allyship more in the older grades where again, that self-discovery 
and um, commitment uh, starts to develop and then we can talk about like action and also being real about the fact that there are these backtracks that happen, right? So I think about like, you know, my, my, my friend of color who like really called me out for something that I said or did, like shame came up and like, how do, how do I work through that embarrassment and come back to that place where instead of saying, well, I'm done, this is just too hard, I come back to that recommitment and action, right? So I think that could be a really useful space. But again, you gotta be really clear because some people see white affinity and some people are like, is this a supremacist group, right? And communities of color are like white affinity. Like, can't we have just one thing that's like special for us in a world where everything is made for white people anyway, right? Um, and then there are some, um, folks are like that seems awfully like a performative space where people just show up to be seen and be recognized as an ally so there are so many like ways that it can be challenged but it can be done it's about it's about intentionality and clarity and um always be uh coming back to that focus of what we said we were going to do so many gems in what you just said <laughs> Oh, I'm stuck. Okay, I'm gonna have to re replay this video. <laughs> um, Gina, switching gears. What sort of connections do you see forged between affinity groups and other areas of school life, like admissions or development? How do affinity groups positively impact other areas of the school experience? Oh, wow. So many ways. A lot of the schools that we work with, um, we have a direct co correlation between our affinity spaces, um, our race-based affinity spaces, and the recruitment process. Uh, as we know, parents are the best ambassadors for schools. Um, so our departments and admission um, have a number of ways to engage our affinity spaces. So that's why it's such a great network and resource group. It's like right there, you know? Um, so that partnership is strong. Of course, there's the partnership between the development office and our um, affinity spaces. I, I, you know, I remember uh, back in the day, because it's like 14 years, I'm like an old OG in the business, like 14 years in independent school. And I remember switching jobs and I'm like, I can't write that extra check. Not this year, you know, not for the annual fund. You got tuition, but that's all we can get. So I missed a year. And it was through my affinity space that, you know, I found out that, you know, 100% participation is more important than the dollar amount, mm -hmm. right? So from that point on, I never missed whether I was sending the dollar, I didn't send the dollar, but you know, it, it, whatever it was. So I learned, so the development office is another great partnership. There's great partnerships between our parent affinity groups and our student affinity groups. Mm -hmm. Right? So right now, a lot of our parent affinity groups are checking in with our students, particularly you know, at, because of the Blacks ad or the mm -hmm. Speaks Out um, platforms. And we are making sure that um, the demands that all of a sudden seem like they're being met, wait a minute, let's back up. So you, is there a timeline here? You know, let's, we want to make sure that you, not only, you know, are you heard and it's, it, it's not just kind of used as, as a way to kind of get out of this tight squeeze to say, okay, we want to make sure that your demands are really being met. So the relationship between um, students and parent affinity groups are great. And, you know, you just check in every once in a while. Um, I think the affinity group um, across like the parent group. So if you have a black affinity group for parents and you have an Asian affinity group for parents or an international parent group, those are some of the tougher ones I think to kind of coalesce because the whole point is that you're in your affinity space. But I will tell you that um, the affinity spaces are really great precursors for the other areas of parent leadership in the school. So I went from being co-chair to you know, holding several executive positions in the PA because I, you know, I was able to work within community, develop community, have voice and visibility and, and kind of fan out. So um, there's a lot of exchange, partnership between your head of school. I, and I keep saying head of school. I don't know how you feel about this, Rosetta. You know, some people are like, well, you're skipping like three other layers here, right, of leadership. You know, head of school has a big job. You know, it's not just you, <laughs> POC. Um, but, you know, I, I, 
I don't know. I, I happen to have a really great relationship with my head of school and many mm -hmm. families that I work with. I, I tell them, you must know your head of school, right? They, they, they are the one, that's the vision and everything kind of trickles down from there. Mm -hmm. So I think those relationships are important mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I would end with this, the curriculum department is another great partnership um, for affinity groups to have, um, who, to decide, you know, well, why, is it, why that book? Well, you're trying to get to point B, there's another book to do that mm -hmm. that's more equitable and more culturally responsive. Yeah. And I, and I find it uh, really interesting that teachers are like, I just can't find the books. I'm like, talk to the parents because they have been curating the right books and affirming books and reflective books for their kids for decades and passing on that knowledge to each other in a school system that often does not. Okay. So like, if you don't want to do your homework, just to let you know, there are plenty of people who have, don't tell me that you can't find them because it actually tells me you haven't looked. And, and I, and I want to just bounce back off of that. I, I was speaking with a group of parents recently mm -hmm. and um, this one woman, you know, she keeps saying the same thing over and over. It's similar to don't make me the moral compass, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is, that's not my job to find a book. You can't tell me that mm -hmm. as uh, this celebrated educator mm -hmm. with three different degrees that you can't find a book and you're coming to me for it like mm -hmm. that seems a little disingenuous but i hear you right like because we've done it we've yeah. we've we've we sat down with the curriculum department and and looked at you know line item and said okay here's some alternative books to maybe get one mm -hmm. one of those books and that's a lot of effort mm -hmm. on our part you know yeah. we have lives where mm -hmm. you know and then to to not really be yeah. heard can be crushing Absolutely. Well, and, uh, and ultimately, I think about make sure that you're tapping the folks who want to have that role, right? So one of the things that I suggest to teachers is actually parent affinity spaces have been putting out blogs and sharing resource spaces. And so they are not private spaces. You can actually like check out like uh, books for South Asian children, right? And like South Asian parents have been curating stuff. And so take a look. But again, it takes there are people who have been generous, use that generosity. And if there are folks who feel like being generous with you, then definitely take advantage and say thank you and listen. So conversely, we just have another uh, question. Uh, this person says, I see nothing but good about affinity spaces for students and community members, but what are the downsides or the inherent risks? In other words, what could go wrong? Mm. And what might be some early indicators that an affinity space is not going well? Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll sort of uh, take on a, um, at least some of this. Uh, one of the things that I think about is actually making sure that affinity groups are, um, that, that, that are inclusive of the spectrum with, of the group, right? And so for example, I'm an Asian affinity group leader, but I have to pay attention, and I'm an East Asian person of Korean heritage, right? And so I need to make sure that I'm not creating a space for me and kids like me. I need to create a space for Asians and Pacific Islanders. That means I need to create a space that feels inclusive of East Asians and Southeast Asians and South Asians and Pacific Islanders. So if all of my activities are actually East Asian based, that's actually not an inclusive space, even though I said it was an API affinity group, right? I also think about like, you know, Gina, you talked about like not all skin folk, uh, skin folk or, you know, kin folk. Um, I think about sometimes actually uh, it, it needs to uh, recognize that how people uh, show up it, as, as members of the group are actually different. Um, I think about, for example, um, like I, I remember um, actually having a pretty tough conversation with the African-American affinity group leader because one of the things that we were doing was we were doing, tr tr doing things like community building through things like each affinity group would like host a movie night where we can break bread and be in community and like watch something and so that it had like a social and learning and community building element to it. And um, I got to say, this particular leader ended up doing like um, the Medea series movies, right? Mm -hmm. And I understand that that is a reflection of an aspect of the African-American experience. But a lot of families were like, 
honestly, of all of the role modeling, as aspiring, like here's what we have overcome. And yes, absolutely, we should celebrate uh, Black uh, creators who are making media and finding success at that. But really, is that like, how many of these movies do we have to go through? And uh, that is not the black experience that I'm teaching my kids. And so I think about ultimately that space was for some kids and not others. And I think she had internalized a lot of the in-group classism that shows up, right? Uh, so this idea of like um, bougie or colorism within the group or like how multiracial people are not quite black. I think there was a lot of attitude that, uh, that leaked into the affinity space. And so my thing is, that space is not for me, it's for the kids in the room. Because as much as I wanted to support the kids who are first generation uh, immigrants who are struggling, managing, going home and living an ethnic life and coming to school and showing up as the all American kid and code switching fundamentally every single time. And I can't have my friends come over because, you know, like they're gonna see me in this whole new setting behaving in a completely different way. I wanted to support that kid. That kid did not exist in my school. Right. Uh, and so the curriculum that I had created was not for kids in that in that space. And that was my mistake when I first started. Most of my kids were actually multiracial Asian kids whose white parent was actually dominating the cultural experience of the home. It was actually um, about transracially adopted kids who look Asian and have all of the expectations of Asian ness being put on them. But culturally speaking, they, they're in a white home. And I needed to create curriculum to help them process the experience of race, which was not what I was doing. So. Mm -hmm. We have about nine, 10 more minutes um, and there are plenty of more questions. So I wanna keep it moving. Yeah. Gina, is there a role for the board of directors in supporting and sustaining affinity groups? Well, you know, from with my parent hat on, not with my RISE parent leader hat on. Um, in my affinity group, we have a board member who's part of our affinity group and we love it. It's awesome. So yes, there is a role. I mean, you know, some, some folks like to, you know, keep that separate, but it, but we're community, right? This isn't, this isn't corporate America, although, you know, there's a lot of structure that looks similar, but um, we're, we're thrilled to have this board member because she has a different lens right? And she's able to kind of reel it in, although she hangs with us, right? You know, um, she's a parent first. She is able to, you know, she has a seat at that table, which is helpful in how we strategize and mobilize mm -hmm. and, you know, figure things out and have an impact. So, um, you know, if there are any board members who you know, also have, you know, have your parents clearly at the school, they should not, I don't think that they should shy away. They need a safe space too. You know, they need a space to develop as well. Yeah. And I think about the role of the board in terms of making sure that when they have things like um, in their strategic plans, like, um, like, diversity aspects of strategic plans, they can actually put down things like, you know, um, more targeted uh, recruitment plans and, uh, uh, and establishing affinity groups as a part, part of a five-year strategic plan. Absolutely. And whatever ground level resistance you get, it is great to be able to say it's part of our strategic plan. That's it. Just saying, just That's saying. It. That's it. Hey, Rosetta, Rosetta um, a, a question has just come in. Wondering if the panelists recommend making affinity groups mandatory or voluntary, especially given the world we're living in today. <laughs> I, I'd like to say, I think it, um, as far as people of color, BIPOC, I'm still getting my mouth ready for that. I, I, I think I like, I like that acronym. Um, I think for black and brown folks, I think it's, it's, it's critical and it should come from um, a place of empathy for their children. Like, you know, like how could I not, mm -hmm. you know, be a part of a, a parent affinity group that's gonna support our kids? How can my child not be a part of that affinity space where they might need that at the end of the day or, you know, to have, to, to have support and social and emotional support or, or maybe just have a think tank, right? To build consensus around something. So I think that, for families of color, it should be voluntary, but that that should really be on your heart. I think for, I'd like to say it, for, for white parents, I think it should be mandatory. 
Well, I think about it this way. That's going to happen. So yeah, I, I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> and it's not going to happen. So for me, <laughs> it's really thinking about like, what are the things that we can mandate and what are the things that we can't? I feel like affinity spaces actually ought to be voluntary because I think about, for example, like if you make everybody participate in affinity groups, I know from the Asian experience that not all Asians pe people consider themselves people of color. Right. right. Oh, yes. And actually, I don't consider all Asian people, people of color, the way they show up. They actually align much more with whiteness yeah. than uh, BIPOC experience. Right. And so for me, I right. want people in the room who want to engage in that conversation and actually identify that way. Now, here are the places where it is mandatory. Right. Which is things like curriculum, things like school assemblies, things like you know, we ask pe parents, uh, like one of the things uh, that we do is like back to, back to school night or parent teacher conferences. There are cultural elements where you're supposed to come. And I think about like as a parent in this community, uh, we will offer uh, multiple opportunities to learn about identity, difference, cross-cultural communication, um, like, uh, you know, whatever it is. And as a part of a community, we're committed to increasing our cultural competency for the, uh, for the success of all children. So you are expected to show up to one of the two, two of the six offerings this year, right? That is part of our commitment, just like tuition is a part of the commitment. Our engaging in a learning process is a part of the commitment of being a member of the school. I think those are the things that we can do. Excellent. So one final question for you each. Who's doing this well? <laughs> who do you look to, given that you guys have worked in this space for so long, who do you look to as, ah, either they have course corrected and they're doing great, or what does success look like? What, is, what are your thoughts around who's, who's doing this well? Gina, will you take this really talking about affinity spaces, affinity groups? Yes, yes. Um, talking about the groups of the school itself? Just take your pick. We don't have that long, okay, so, unfortunately. Okay, yeah, I was talking about that. I didn't, I didn't need to tease that apart. Mm -hmm. um, I think my school is doing a great job, you know, um, you know, it was there when I arrived 14 years ago. You want to know the name of the school? Sure. If you're willing to share. So it's Riverdale Country School. And, and tell and, us why you think they're doing so well. Um, because they are, um, they're flexible and they're open and they have buy-in from the top. Mm -hmm. um, they know the value of the affinity spaces. Mm -hmm. They they leverage the affinity spaces, right? I mean, sometimes I feel as if a lot of my um, my peer families wonder, like, well, why why does the, you know pe people of color group, the pair in the color group, have court? How how are they holding court, right? Because we're we're asking for it, and we're 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 being offered that space. So I think that they're doing well um, in that we are you know, allow a lot of different voices to come and lead our affinity spaces. So every, you know, two years we shift leadership in our affinity spaces. And, um, you know, not everybody's going to be like me. I'm not like everyone, but we respect what each other brings to the table, right? You know, and so there's a lot of intersectionality with us and we respect each other for that. And it's a really awesome space. And it's, it was, it's been so, um, valuable to have during this this moment of remote learning as well. Yeah. It's been great. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm i going to toot my own school's horns too, right? And so we have, gosh, um, I love the fact, the richness of our affinity program so that lots of uh, students get to connect about aspects of their identity. So we have uh, the African American affinity group, the Asian Pacific Islander affinity group, the multiracial affinity group, the Jewish affinity group, uh, the Latinx affinity group, the uh, banana splits, who are kids who live in um, homes where maybe they experience bro like divorce or single parenthood or like things like that. Uh, we also have a uh, learning differences affinity group, but they decided to call themselves the brain stuff affinity group so that they can talk about what it's like to be going to school when you have a learning di difference, whether it's been diagnosed or not. You just know that that's part of your experience. Um, uh, we also recently started a uh, uh, multi-faith alliance, interfaith alliance, so that pe kids of faith can actually come together to learn about each other's and actually build understanding and connections across uh, religious faith systems. Um, 
And so uh, and we have adoption affinity group uh, so that kids who are adopted can connect. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we went from being sort of like an organic, like we just, kids are, like, honestly, I started a, the affinity group, group program at my school, mostly because the Asian kids kept on wanting to have lunch with me. And I'm like, we look like this weird Asian gang, go to Spurs, right? But then when I started, uh, when I went to my first people of color conference and I participated in the affinity space, I'm like, oh, that's what they're looking for. So yeah. once I set up the affinity space, they were actually willing to sit with their peers. Um, but, um, you know, ultimately, um, it started really organically, but it's now a very formal part of the school's life, right? And so they're, the, the affinity leaders are stipended. Um, they are trained. We have meetings to strategize around be best practices. There, it is expected that we advocate for the students and amplify uh, concerns or address them, uh, help address them. Um, I would say our shortcoming is actually working with the families. Uh, because we're, we've, we've done such a good job with the student space, but I think their families could use uh, getting together. And I would say we've relied a lot more on parent leadership. So we've had uh, like uh, parents of color. I think there's a staff member right now who is like um, really trying to get a uh, whole, uh, get the, on the ground and running the families of color, like affinity space. And I hope that's successful and that the school backs up that space just as rigorously as we do the student space. But I would say at least in the student space, I'm really proud of where, we, where we've come from and what we've become. Ditto, I would say the same for, for students. Our student affinity spaces have, um, they, they're growing and flourishing as well. And, and we can talk about that parent affinity space, Rosetta, I'll yeah. talk to you. The scenes. I just love banana splits. I just think that is the cutest thing. There's also and one called M and M's. It's for the, I think multiracial families, so they call them M and M's. And you know, there's I love it when groups come up with their own yeah. name. <laughs> you find that creativity happens as the, the students get older, right? You know, so once they're in the upper school, middle and upper school, they, you know, become really creative with ways to identify. Mm -hmm. And I just love, honestly, Rosetta, I mean, it sounded like you have like 2,000 affinity groups. It's like, yeah. <laughs> and but we you make the point. 20 kids. <laughs> wow. But you make the point that you can build it around anything. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that there's value in that. So it is six o'clock. It is time for us to say goodbye to our panelists. I appreciate you immensely. This will be posted on the PSV YouTube channel. And I will also email out many resources that Rosetta and Gina have graciously shared with us. And... Uh, Thank you, ladies. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Private School Village. Enjoy yeah. the conversation. Thank you for hosting. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Uh-oh. We're still here, Rosetta. I'm just going to hit leave. Uh, yeah, I think Lisa left and then I sort of automatically became a host. Uh, let's see. Uh oh, I've forgotten the rep from Private School Village. Your name. I'm, I'm here. I okay. do not have the ability and everyone that has not logged out yet can hear everything. Yes, and yes, see. I know. So, so I'm going to make you stuff. host and then sign out. How's cool. that? All right. Thank <laughs> you. Bye. Bye.